Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IES. Welcome to another session of Economy this week, wherein we will be taking up all the important economy related articles which have appeared in various business related newspapers in the last one week that is from 17th to 23rd September and we will be analyzing these particular articles. Let us begin the discussion. The first very important article that has appeared and will continue to appear in the next couple of weeks is the issue of WTO dispute settlement. Now, what is the important point here? WTO basically a world trade organization, it is an international organization, India is a member of it. This organization basically promotes the trade in the global market. And whenever there is a dispute between the member countries, let us say there is a dispute between India and Australia, India and USA, USA and China, the member countries approach WTO, get the dispute resolved. Now, focus on the dispute part of it. Why? Whenever you talk about the dispute settlement under WTO, a member country initially goes to WTO, files a complaint, files a dispute against another country or a group of countries. And the next step is WTO that is a dispute settlement body under this will ask the member countries which are involved in a dispute to mutually resolve the dispute either through consultation or mediation resolve the dispute. Now, many of you will simply say sir what is the difference between a WTO and a dispute settlement body here? Under WTO the highest decision making body is a ministerial conference, but the ministerial conference does not take care of the day to day decision making. And that is a precise reason after ministerial conference there is a general council and it is this particular general council which acts as a dispute settlement body as well as the trade policy review body. The dispute settlement body meets once every month or whenever the member countries demand that there should be a meet of the DSB. And the role of the dispute settlement body is to ensure that any dispute amongst the member countries of WTO, the dispute should be resolved. Now, going back to the earlier discussion, the first step is approach the dispute settlement body, file a complaint and if the complaint cannot be resolved mutually, then the dispute settlement body will appoint an appellate panel and the appellate panel consisting of experts will investigate the issue, find something right in, in, a, in simple terms, whether they will find that country A is wrong or country B is wrong and both of the countries A and B are involved in a dispute. Now, whatever the findings of the panel, a member country against whom the order has come or against whom the findings have been found, uh, issued, now will have the right to appeal against it. Now, the next point is basically go to appellate body and this is where the current affairs is connected. The appellate body basically takes care of the order or let us say the findings of the appellate panel or the expert panel and will give the observations whether the findings are correct, they are going to accept it or overturn it etc. And understand the logic here, whenever appellate body has to take up the appeals like this, we require three members. Three members in the appellate body have to take up the appeal of a member country. Now, follow the current affairs. The total number of membership in the appellate body is 7 members, total number of membership, 7 members. And the appointment of 7 members is done in such a way that or the appointments are stacked in such a way that at any point of time, there is a minimum required number of members who are present in the appellate body. But in the last couple of years, what USA government has done is, it has been opposing, it has been opposing mind you the appointment to the members in the appellate body. Now, many of you simply say sir USA opposes it, what is the problem? Let other countries go forward, it is not that easy. Why? Whenever the appointment of the members has to happen to the appellate body, it is a done through consensus. It is a done through consensus means every member country should agree and I hope you know that WTO right within that there are more than 160 member countries. USA is one of them. So, USA has been vetoing in a sense the appointment of the members to the appellate body. As a result of this from 7 number came down to 6, 5, 4, 3 and finally in 2019 
even the last member who was the part of the appellate body, he is tenure, right? the person's tenure got over. Generally, the tenure or the term of the people is of four years whenever they are appointed to the appellate body. Now, if 2019, if the last member's term is also over, now how many members are there in the appellate body? No one is appointed, everybody's tenure or term is over, how many members are there? Zero people. And if there are zero people in the appellate body, how can the dispute settlement body effectively function? Post 2019, 24 cases or in case of 24 right, disputes, the member countries have appealed at the appellate body, including India by the way. In out of these particular 24 cases, there are 4 cases in which government of India has gone to appellate body, appealed against the findings of the expert panel. But the issue is that because there are no members, forget about having 3 members, because there are no members in the appellate body since 2019, all these cases are simply pending. And that is the precise reason the dispute settlement body which at one point of time was referred to as a crown jewel of WTO, today has become a dysfunctional body. It is there but it is not functioning efficiently because after the expert panel will find the or give the report, the member countries are going to appellate body and there itself the process had got stuck up. Now, in, in order to address this, this is the current affairs point. In order to address this, the United States trade representative, a government official of the US government has called the member countries of WTO wants to resolve, discuss and resolve the deadlock or the issue that has taken place in the dispute settlement body. So, this is the basic concept of dispute settlement body, appellate body and the current affairs related to that. Now, based on this, I have given an MCQ here. Consider the following statements regarding dispute settlement body DSB. The 5 permanent members along with the 10 other members are the only representatives in the DSP. Underline the term only. This statement is wrong. Why? All the member countries of WTO will have a representation in the dispute settlement body. Whether you are a permanent member in the UN SC or a non-permanent member does not matter. All the members of WTO will have a representation in the DSP. Second statement, the general council will act as a dispute settlement body. I have already discussed this. Statement 2 is correct. Right option for the question is option B only 2 is correct. Next, next article regarding the banks which are seeking widening of priority sector lending right concept. Now, what do you mean by a priority sector lending? Every bank in India which is registered or which is regulated by Reserve Bank of India has to follow a concept of rationing of credit. I hope you know the idea for rationing of credit. Rationing basically is one tool which is used by RBI under its monetary policy and this is an example of qualitative set of tool. Qualitative set of tool. Now, those who are listening to the lecture or listening to this particular video, let me ask you a very simple question. What do you think is the difference between a quantitative set of tool and qualitative set of tool? And I hope you understand both are different. Do not say both are one and the same. Only spelling is different. Absolutely no. Both are different. So, tell me in the comment section, what is the difference between a qualitative and a quantitative set of tool? And one example of a qualitative set of tool is the idea of a rationing of credit. What do you mean by rationing? Rationing basically means allocation or distribution. Now, within this idea of a rationing of credit, the tool that is used by RBI is priority sector lending, PSL. Under priority sector lending, the banks are supposed to keep aside 40 percent of their credit and ensure that the 40 percent of the credit will reach to following sections or following sectors in the economy. For example, MSME sector, education, export, right, or let us say social infrastructure, weaker sections of the society, or the most important one, agriculture sector. The most important one is agriculture sector itself. Why? 18 percent of the ANBC, adjusted net bank credit, 
is mandated to be given to the agriculture sector itself and within this again some of it is reserved for small and marginal farmers. Now come to the point in the current affairs here. There are many banks which are supposed to be approaching RBI with a proposal to widen the ambit of priority sector lending. Right? Why? Why are they approaching the RBI with a proposal to widen PSL? Right now, as I have already told you, there are limited number of sectors, around 8 sectors which are supposed to be covered under PSL. And the banks are supposed to meet 40% target on annual basis. These banks, right, which are approaching RBI, now want RBI to widen the ambit and say that even the financing that you provide for sustainable financing, that is the projects which will come under the sustainable financing, even those projects will be covered with the PSL tag now. Right, important point. The banks want RBI to even classify those particular sectors which will be given sustainable financing to be given the PSL tag. Now, multiple points to be covered here. First and foremost, what do you mean by sustainable financing? In a nutshell, in a very simple terms, if I want to define a sustainable financing, it simply means whenever, whenever you provide a loan or a credit to any of the promotion of let us say services which will help in achieving certain objectives such as reduction of emission, promotion of renewable energy etc. So, any kind of financing that you provide and you help in meeting these objectives, this financing is called as a sustainable financing. If I want to give a very simple example, government of India wants to achieve 175 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity and this is related to our targets right, that is nationally determined contribution target of having 40 percent of non-fossil based consumption of energy. Right, so, if you provide the loans to this, automatically if, if RBI agrees, automatically this will be covered under the PSL tag. Now, on what basis even the government or let us say RBI will provide the PSL tag? As of now, the practice is very simple. Whenever RBI or government of India feels that you need this kind of a financing to promote development in the economy, RBI provides a PSL tag to such projects or such lending. Now, the banks want RBI to widen the ambit, cover even the sustainable financing so that it will help them in meeting the PSL targets one and second, right, because the government of India is promoting so many projects which are associated with let us say conservation or sustainable development, these banks will be able to focus, give the loans and achieve the objectives and also meet the PSL lending targets. So, these are certain very important points given in the context of banks seeking RBI to widen the ambit of PSL. Let me go to the next two important articles regarding production linked incentive. Two articles are there. One is regarding Chinese firms right, having a market share or dominating market share in the mobile manufacturing and the second one, government of India very recently announcing 19,500 crore worth of PL, PLI for sora, solar cell manufacturing in India. Let me start with the first article here. PLI stands for production linked incentive. I am pretty sure all of you know this. Under PLI, government of India has identified 14 sectors and government says, I want to promote investment production, employment, exports in all of these particular sectors. And to achieve all of these objectives from these particular 14 sectors, government of India has launched a scheme by the name of production linked incentive. Under PLI scheme, government of India will target investments, give it as a target to companies which are covered under this. Government will also give a target of exports. Government will also give a target of right, selling the goods in the market and incentives are attached. Generally what you see is, follow this carefully, generally what you see is incentives given under the scheme are connected to incremental sales. I repeat, generally what you observe is the incentives that are provided under the scheme are connected to incremental sales. What do you mean by incremental sales here? Compared to base year, how much has been the rise or increase in the sales that will be counted as incremental sale 
and the incentive is given on the incremental sale. But I will go to the concept of solar cell manufacturing. Remember this particular point. In case of solar cell manufacturing, government of India has not given the incentive connected to the incremental sales. Rather, government of India has connected the in incentives to the investment itself. Why you will understand in a minute. But what is given in this article? Government of India has identified mobile manufacturing as one of the sectors under PLI, has announced a lot of incentives under this initiative itself or in this particular sector. Having said so, government of India saying that we want to ensure that this incentive or this subsidy will go to only right some of the companies, not the companies coming from China, has not included any company from China that is a smartphone manufacturer manufacturer from China under the PLI initiative for mobile manufacturing. Despite this, despite this, the article says that it is the Chinese companies which are involved in the smartphone manufacturing which have basically commanded the majority of the market share in India. How is that possible? And why these particular companies are unable to match or compete with the Chinese companies? The reasons which have been given are very simple. One. Chinese firms, they are not manufacturing and importing the goods or mobile phones into India. Rather, they are basically assembling, they are assembling these particular products in the Indian market. So, what is the advantage here? Either way, it is a mobile phone, what is the advantage? If they import a mobile phone, government of India will impose a very high amount of customs duties, taxes on it. They want to circumvent it, they want to escape from it. So, they have started assembling these particular products in India. That is the first thing. Second thing, the labor in case of India is cheaper. So, in addition to this, cheaper labor is also helping them. Third, the Chinese companies are also saying, apart from this, we want to be very nearer to the market. The customer base for us is in India. We want to be nearer. So, they have started producing these particular mobile phones in India itself. And that is the precise reason in the last one year, many of the Indian companies, I will repeat, many of the Indian mobile manufacturers have lost the market share. On the other hand, Chinese manufacturers have gained more and more commanding market share in the smartphone manufacturing in India. This is one article. Second article is regarding solar cell manufacturing and this is covered under PLI now. And if you remember some time ago, I stated that government of India has announced 19,500 crore PLI for solar cell manufacturing. Is it the first time? No. Last year in the month of November, government of India has already announced 4,500 crore worth of PLI incentives for this particular sector. In addition to this, now 19,500 crore rupees worth of PLI again has been allocated. And this is not anything new, this was announced in the budget itself. It was announced in the budget, has been cleared very recently by the cabinet. So, totally under PLI, now around 24,000 crore worth of incentives would be provided to promote solar cell manufacturing unit in India. Having said so, I told you one more point as well. I said that generally you will see that government will attach the incentive to the incremental sales. But in the context of solar cell manufacturing, it is not attached to the incremental sales. Most of it is, that is 12,000 crore rupees has been attached to the investments made. The investments that have been made. Sir, why? Why is the government of India changing the policy now? Why can't we simply connect it to the incremental sales? Why change and connect it to investment? Because generally whenever you manufacture a solar module, the flow chart or the supply chain is very simple. right? You start with polysilicone, then you manufacture ingots, wafers, then you manufacture the solar cells. Government of India says that these, what is required to manufacture a cell and a module, the precursors of it are not produced in India not very well produced in India. So, I want to promote investment in those and that is a precise reason investments have been taken as a target and the incentives under the scheme are connected to the investments made here. 
So, these are certain important points regarding the PLI scheme which is there in the newspaper in the last one week. Based on this, I have given a question here. Consider the following regarding PLI. The PLI for solar cells will provide the incentives based on the incremental sales. Statement is wrong. There are 13 sectors as of now covered under the PLI scheme. The statement 2 is also wrong. Very recently, 14th sector also has been added. That is a drones. So, there are 14 sectors now, not 13 sectors. So, both the options are wrong. Right option is neither one nor two, option D. Let me go to the next article. IBBI allowing for partial resolution of assets. What do you mean by this? Let me start with a very simple example. Imagine here is a company. The company has taken loan from a bank and the company has defaulted on the repayment what is the next step? The bank will drag the company to insolvency and bankruptcy court, file an application at NCLT, National Company Law Tribunal, and in the next 330 days, the process of insolvency resolution is conducted. And that is the basic idea of IBC. Having said so, if you have read articles regarding how effective is the IBC, you would have realized one point. On paper, we are supposed to finish the process in 330 days, but in reality, it takes more than 330 days. One of the reasons, one of the reasons cited is, what if the company consists of multiple assets? One of the asset is a loss making. One of the assets owned by the company is loss making. Let us say remaining two assets are profit making ventures. Now, this will basically delay the process. Why? Many bidders want to find out if they purchase the whole company, what will be their issue regarding this loss making business of the company? Should they include even that asset? Should they exclude that asset? How much will be the hit that they will be taking? At what price they are supposed to bid etc. This will delay the process. Now, what IBBI, Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India, IBBI stands for Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India. What IBBA says is, henceforth, we will introduce a new system wherein, imagine the same company, three different businesses are there, three different assets are there. One is a loss making asset, remaining two are a profit making asset. Then the bidders, that is the companies who wants to purchase these particular assets, they can simply come forward with a, with a proposal including these two assets and excluding the loss making asset. They can come forward and say, we will include and we want to buy only these two assets of the company, not the third one because it is incurring a loss. Now, what is the objective? You already know the objective here. If this is done, don't you think the number of days that is taken for conducting insolvency resolution will come down? Whenever a company is dragged to NCLT, now the process can be concluded much faster. The capital that is getting stuck for a longer duration now will be freed in a shorter duration of a time. With that objective, IBBI has come out with a proposal to allow for partial resolution of the assets or businesses. This is the gist of the article provided here. Next, India ASEAN FTA. In fact, to be very technical here, there were two FTAs which were in discussion in the newspaper in the last one week. One is India ASEAN FTA, Free Trade Agreement, and India Sri Lanka FTA. The government of Sri Lanka very recently has announced that they want to rework and widen the scope of FTA that they have with India. That is also there in the newspaper. Please be very careful. Second one, India ASEAN Free Trade Agreement. What is the update on this? Follow the argument here. Whenever two countries, let us say A and B, sign a free trade agreement, what we expect is the overall trade will increase. The overall trade between the two countries will increase or two groups will increase. And with the rise in the overall trade, we expect that both of the countries or both of the sides in the agreement to get the benefit of the agreement. Sir, what do you mean by this? Imagine right now the total trade between A and B is a 50 billion dollars and after the agreement is done, it will increase to let us say 100 billion dollars. 
right? So, overall trade has increased with the signing of the agreement, first point. But in addition to this, what we also expect is both of the countries or both the parties in the agreement to get the benefit of the trade. What if only one part of the or one side of the agreement will get the maximum benefit, other country or other party does not get the maximum benefit. Sir, what do you mean by this? Let me quote a Niti Aayog report here. As per Niti Aayog report, the trade agreement that was signed between India and ASEAN has led to increase in the trade. Between 2011 to 2017, the overall trade has increased from 50 billion dollar to 70 billion dollars. Agreed, the trade has increased. But in the same duration, in the same duration, the trade deficit of India also has increased. I will repeat it. From 2011 to 2017, now many of you will say, sir, why are you taking from 2011? Simple. It was in the year 2010 that the trade agreement was signed and enforced. So, from 11 to 17, the overall trade has increased, but at the same point of time, India's trade deficit also has increased. Now, many of you will ask me, sir, how is that possible? How is that possible? Because whenever I have read about FTA, it says that, the member countries whenever they sign the FTA or the group of countries whenever they sign the FTA, they are going to either eliminate or reduce the barriers. If the other country that is let us say group of countries ASEAN has eliminated the barriers, how is that possible that India is still having a trade deficit? Reason is very simple, whenever they talk about trade barriers here, they are talking about tariff barriers. But there are also other barriers which are called as a non-tariff barriers such as a public procurement policy, such as a quota system, monetary restriction, etc. And whenever such non-tariff barriers are imposed, please remember this, the non-tariff barriers are much more effective compared to tariff barriers. So, as a result of this, what has happened to India's trade deficit? India's trade deficit with ASEAN has increased. A government of India says, this is not fair, I want a review of this free trade agreement and that is exactly what is given in the article here. And government of India says, I want the agreement to be reworked, reviewed, so that there is a transparency, the non-tariff barriers which are faced by Indian companies in ASEAN countries will also be addressed. Right? This is the gist of the article provided here, I have given an MCQ. Consider the following statements. India ASEAN FTA came into force from 1998. Statement 1 is wrong. Sir, why have you given 1998? Any specific reason for this? This is the year when India and Sri Lanka free trade agreement was signed. India SL, the FTA was signed in 1998, enforced from 2000. With this, the overall trade has increased. Statement 2 is correct. With this, India's trade deficit has increased. Statement 3 is also correct. So, 2 and 3 are correct. Right option for the question is option C, both 2 and 3. Next article regarding fund infusion in the regional rural banks. RRB stands for regional rural bank. Now, understand the logic here. Government of India has announced that 10,890 crore rupees worth of funds will be infused in the regional rural banks. Why? RRBs have been suffering. RRBs, there are many RRBs working in India. The role of the RRBs is basically focus on, right, the districts, one or two districts and ensure that the credit requirements in these two districts, especially rural part, will be addressed. But because of very high expansion, higher operational expenses, higher NPS, lower mobilization of the deposits, the RRBs have been incurring losses. So, government of India now says, I will infuse funds into RRBs in financial aid 22 and 23. In the financial aid 22 as well as financial aid 23, I am going to infuse 10,890 crores. I will come to this number also, give me a minute. But I want the RRBs to come out with a proposal, a plan so that certain targets are given to RRBs and they will adhere and try to achieve these particular targets. What kind of plan? The RRBs are supposed to give targets 
for next three years in terms of let us say reduction in the NPAs, in terms of issuing of the credit, improving governance standards, etc. So, the board of RRB has to come out with the proposal and show that they are able to meet these particular targets, they are going to achieve the targets in the next couple of years and government of India says, I will infuse 10,890 crores into RRBs. Now, come to the number of 10,890 crore rupees. Although I said government is saying, I will infuse the 10,890, please be aware of this. The complete 10,890 will not be given by the government. Half of this will be given by the central government. Now, many of you must be thinking, sir, why? Why is the central giving only half of it? But it is saying 10,890. 10, is it not misleading? Absolutely no. Whenever you talk about RRBs, there are three stakeholders. There are three very important participants in the functioning of RRB. One is the central government, second one is a sponsoring bank and the third one is a state government. Central government owns 50 percent of the stake or infusion in the RRBs. The sponsor banks will have 35 percent stake and remaining 15 percent is of the state government. So, center says mine is half, I will infuse half of it, remaining will come from the sponsor as well as the state governments. Right? So, this is the basic idea of government of India announcing fund infusion in these particular RRBs. In addition to this, a week ago, there was one more article regarding RRBs. Under that government of India, that is Minister of Finance has asked RRBs to find a viable solution go to the market, conduct the IPO and raise capital. Have you understand this? Those RRBs which are viable, viable in the sense they are meeting certain threshold standards. For example, have a look at this. Those particular RRBs which have a minimum net worth of 300 crore rupees and a capital to risk weighted assets a ratio of 9 percent minimum, they can basically go for an IPO, issue shares and raise capital from the market. Right, these are the two very important points regarding regional rural banks in recent times. Next article is regarding PM Pranam scheme. PM Pranam scheme. The PM Pranam stands for Pradhan Mantri or Prime Minister Promotion of Alternate Nutrients for Agriculture Management Yojana. This is the long form of PM Pranam. Now, what is it associated with? PM Pranam is associated with reducing the consumption of chemical fertilizers. Remember this, it is associated with reduction in the consumption of chemical fertilizers. Why? Between 1718 to 2021, the amount of chemical fertilizers mainly, right, the mainly four ones that is urea, diammonium phosphate, murate of potash, NPKS complex fertilizer, the overall consumption in the domestic market has increased by 21 percent in the last four years. And government of India has says that there are certain negative consequences to consuming more and more chemical fertilizers like this. Forget about the import cost of it, the subsidy given by the government etc. These are all the problems, but there are also environmental consequences to having very high consumption of chemical fertilizers. Now, government by implementing this scheme wants to reduce the consumption of chemical fertilizers. How? The details of the scheme are yet to be announced. It is said that it is there in a consultation stage, but basics of the scheme are like this. The states, the average consumption of chemical fertilizers for the last three years in a state will be calculated. Now, if you can reduce the consumption in this year, I hope you understand this. If you can reduce the consumption of the last three years average in the coming years, now you will be incentivized for this. You will be provided with incentives. So, what kind of incentives? Government of India as per the article says, we will not have any additional budgetary allocation for this. No, already lot of budgetary allocation has been done for fertilizers. For example, for the last financial year, the allocation was less than 1 crore rupees, 1 lakh crore rupees 
and government of India ended up spending around 1.6 lakh crore rupees on fertilizer subsidy. For the current financial year, the allocation is 1.05 lakh and the revised estimates are pegging this somewhere around 2.2 lakh crore rupees. So, already budgetary allocations have been made. Now, if the state government will reduce the consumption of chemical fertilizers, it also means the central government fertilizer subsidy will be saved, the expenditure would be reduced, subsidy expenditure would be reduced, fertilizer subsidy would be saved of the central government. And the article says that half of the amount that has been saved will be given to the states as in incentives. Again, there is a condition how they are supposed to use it, but this is just what can be done or what is the proposal right now. Is it being implemented? Absolutely no. It is there in a consultation stage right now. So, with the implementation of PM Pranam scheme or Yojra, we expect the reduction in the consumption of chemical fertilizers. The last article for the day, just an update here, PCA framework. Reserve Bank of India has removed Central Bank of India from the PCA framework. So, what is this PCA? PCA stands for Prompt Corrective Action. I repeat, PCA stands for Prompt Corrective Action. Under PCA, RBI will evaluate the performance of the banks under three parameters. I will repeat it. Under PCA, RBI will evaluate the performance of the banks on three parameters. That is one, capital to risk weighted assets ratio, ROA return over assets, and the third one is net NPA and RBI will decide certain thresholds, certain levels for all these three parameters. And if a bank does not meet the threshold numbers, then RBI will impose the restrictions on the functioning of the bank. So, the last bank which was left out under the PCF framework was the Central Bank of India earlier, right, the UCB, etc., many banks, Indian Overseas Bank, right, etc., or Union Bank of India, many of these banks have been kept under PCA and because they have shown improvement, they have been removed out of PCA as well. The only bank which was left out under the PCA is the Central Bank of India and RBI very recently has announced because the Central Bank of India has been able to show the improvement in its finances, they are able to meet the threshold conditions imposed by RBI, these Central Bank of India or this Central Bank of India, which is the only bank under PCA, even that has been removed now. Right? So, this is the update regarding the prompt corrective action framework. So, these are the various articles as well as the questions related to the articles for the duration 17th to 23rd September 2022. If you like the initiative, hit the like button, provide your valuable comments in the section below. And if you have not yet subscribed to Baiju's exam prep IAS, kindly do it now. Thank you. Have a great day.